On 12 News at 4, we are all about bringing you solutions and empowering you to better your lives. Every day, we bring some of the Valley's most experienced professionals to discuss trending topics on health, ways to save money and improve your financial life, the law, relationships. We even have an expert on pets. And it's not just us asking the questions, we give you, the viewer, the opportunity to weigh in and ask questions too. Now, we're putting all these segments together in one place for you. This is Ask the Expert. Well, this Money Saving Monday, we want to dive deeper into a health savings account and a flexible spending account. We know sometimes it can really be confusing, right? Both HSAs and FSAs are for health care costs, and both allow contributions with pre-tax dollars that help you save for qualified medical expenses. But what exactly are those qualified expenses and what are the key differences? Let's ask the expert. Joining me now is Dr. Natasha Bouillon, National Medical Director of One Medical. All right, let's get straight mm -hmm. to it and start with the HSAs. What do people need to know? Yeah, this is great. These are great accounts because it does help us with costs that are outside of typical insurance coverage. Yes. And HSA, we know that there's tax benefits and HSA actually has what we call a triple tax benefit and mm -hmm. the reason why is because it can help you invest spend and also grow your pre-tax dollars, which yeah. is wonderful. And HSA also has the benefit of rolling over. So you can use it year over year. You don't have to use it or lose that money. Mm -hmm. And you own it as the employee or the employer yourself. And that means that if you leave your job, you can still have your HSA for life. And that's a really nice that's benefit huge. as well. Exactly. Yes. The HSA is also nice because it has a higher contribution limit and you can double the contribution limit if it's your family. So it can be $8,300 a year if it's your family. The limit changes every single year, just depending on the IRS. Yeah, I, I always take it to the max because you never know what could happen you medically. Know. Yeah. And, you know, and you can roll it over too, which is great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the one key with the HSA though is you are only eligible if you have a certain type of high deductible health plan. Mm. So if you've got a PPO or an HMO, you might not be qualified. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the FSAs. Yeah, the FSA is a little bit different. So the FSA has a lower contribution limit and really key with the FSA is you're only eligible if your employer offers that as a benefit. And mm -hmm. you know, for the annual contribution limit, it, there is a max by the IRS, but that could change depending on your employer. Okay. They could change that max. Um, the other thing is it's a fixed contribution. And so that means you have to decide at open enrollment how much you're going to put in and mm -hmm. you can't change that amount. Um, the other really key piece too is it's it's employer owned. So if you leave your job or you lose your job, it doesn't roll over with you yes. unless you've got COBRA benefits okay. and those COBRA benefits might continue that coverage. And so I always say with the FSA, the most key aspect is figure out how to spend that money because if you don't spend it quickly, the money's gone. Right. You lose it. Yeah. Exactly. yeah which is panic attack. All yeah. right. So this is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And this is why we, I wanted to do this segment yeah. with you because there are some hidden perks that people do not realize right. when it comes to the HSAs and some things I want you to like dive into, especially when it comes to an LMN. Yeah. So, you know, for an HSA and FSA, I think people know of the typical benefits. You know, yeah. you can spend it on dental and vision. You can spend it on contact lenses. People also sometimes know you can spend it on medical things like sunscreen. Right. What people often don't know is there's a lot of medical costs that you can spend it on they might not think about yes. if they have a letter of medical necessity. So for example, which is the LMN. Yes, letter. LMN is the letter of medical necessity. Yes. So something like a massage therapy, a lot of people don't realize that massage might actually be covered with your FSA or AHSA dollars wow. if it's for a medical reason. So what that means is if you have back pain and your doctor says get a massage because that will help your back pain, yeah. Your doctor can actually write that letter of medical necessity and then you end up having it covered. This also applies to things like gym equipment for the house, like a Peloton oh. or even a gym membership. You know, if you've got obesity or knee pain and your doctor says the treatment for that is to exercise, you could get a letter for them and they would end up covering those benefits. But the key is it can't just be 
I'm trying to get healthy, I'm going to the gym, it's right. for my general wellness. Right. You have to have a medical reason that you're exercising or a medical reason that you're getting that massage. But when you have that medical reason, it really unlocks a lot of doors. Okay, so when you get that medical mm -hmm. reason from your doctor, what do you do with it? Yeah, so when you have that letter from your doctor, you have to submit it to your provider of the okay. HSA or FSA. Mm -hmm. And so that might require uploading it onto their website okay. or emailing them or faxing them. But I would encourage people, reach out to your provider before you just buy that Peloton because yeah. okay. some, some yeah. FSA and HSA providers, they might not cover it. So reach out to the provider to know it's covered before you make that purchase. No kidding. Excellent info. All right, Natasha, thank you. It's time now to ask the expert and back yet again, this time to answer your questions live on air about HSAs and FSAs is Dr. Natasha Bouillon. All right, our first question is from Anne in Scottsdale. She asks, which one can be rolled into next year and which ones you have to use by the end of the year? This is a great question and it's important to know the difference because the FSA, it's use it or lose it. So if you don't use those $3,000 this year, it doesn't roll over to next year. Whereas the HSA, you can keep rolling over year after year. And really some people actually use it as a vehicle for retirement funding as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Tom asks, do you have to sign up with Medicare if you are 65 and still a full-time employee? Yeah, I hear this question a lot because people are working beyond the age of 65 yes. these days. And for some people, they want the money. For other people, they just love feeling the purpose of working. Mm -hmm. If you are employed full time, you don't have to sign up for Medicare. You can choose to get private insurance through your employer. And if that's the case, you can still access an HSA or FSA. Okay. Scott from Phoenix says, how do I know what is eligible for FSA or HSA when I'm shopping and do I need to save my receipts? Oh, that is a good question. Yeah. You know, and there is a website, there's an IRS website that lists out what exactly is eligible, but I don't expect people to know that or reference it, reference it when they're shopping. Yeah. And so I think the best thing people can do is save your receipts. And really the key question is think about what you're purchasing. Is this for a medical need? So you think about something like sunscreen okay. when you're buying that, you are buying sunscreen to prevent yourself from getting skin cancer. Yeah. So really ask yourself that key question. Yes, you do need to save all of your receipts and then you can look later to see if the thing that you purchased was eligible and then you can upload that receipt to get reimbursed. Do you know all this time I did not know that sunscreen was you, under that I know. Well, list. when you think about it, like there's no, I mean, there's a cosmetic reason kind right. of, but it's really to prevent skin cancer. So That's it's huge. a true medical reason. Yes. I'm so using that for my sunscreen. Exactly. All yes. right. Lorraine from Phoenix says, what can I spend this money on? Is it just for me or does it include my family too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a great question. It's qualified medical expenses and it can include people who are dependents on your tax form. So, you know, if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend or a roommate and you don't claim them as a dependent on your taxes, right. you can't, they're not eligible. But if you have a child who's a dependent, their medical expenses are eligible. Okay, good to know. Elena from Chandler says, can I change how much I contribute during the year or is this only at open enrollment? Elena, also a good question. And the reason why is for each one, it's different. So okay. with the HSA throughout the year, you can change your contribution amount. But with the FSA, you can only determine your contribution amount one time during open enrollment. That's and you it. can't change it. So you got to yes. make the right decision. And it's hard to know because people often can't predict what their medical expenses will be. Oh, and so they might say, I'm going to opt for $3,000. And they don't end up spending $3,000. So you kind of have to do a little oh bit of gamification on predicting what you're going to do. And if you don't spend that money, you lose it. Right. Open enrollment is so stressful. So stressful. <laughs> it is, I don't enjoy it. You have to make all kinds of decisions for the I following know. year. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. That was wonderful. And you know what? This is a new thing that we're trying out here because we get so many viewer text questions that we can't get all to them, you know, right now live. Yeah. So we're going to have Natasha go back in our green room and she's going to stay just for a couple more minutes and answer your questions. So Natasha, thank you, thank so, you so very much. much. Well, Natasha, what do people need to know most importantly about the measles? Yeah, so measles is a very highly contagious virus. So 90% of people who are unvaccinated and are exposed, they will catch it. Mm. And the reason why is because the virus can linger in the air for up to two hours after somebody has left the room who's been infected. So this is airborne and we are seeing cases going up and the reason we think why is because we are at a 10-year low in terms of vaccinations more and more people are opting
opting out of getting vaccinations. And sure, some of the symptoms can be mild. You could have fever or rash, but sometimes people have really high fevers. And then we also see, while most people recover from measles, there are some people that can go on to develop pneumonia, brain swelling, or even death. And we wow. know that the people who are at highest risk are kids, pregnant women, and people who are immunocompromised. Okay, so bottom line, if you think you have been exposed, what do you do? Yeah, if you've been exposed, you think you've been exposed, contact your doctor. And the reason why is you could still get a post-vaccine shot oh. after you've been exposed. The other important thing is we need people who are unvaccinated and exposed to quarantine. Because of that really long incubation period, somebody might be exposed, they might be contagious, but they might not show symptoms themselves for up to 21 days. And then really the ultimate bottom line is get vaccinated. These vaccines, they're safe, they're effective, and they save lives. Okay. Excellent information, Dr. Natasha, thank yeah. you. Joining me now is veterinarian Dr. Brett Cordes with Arizona Animal Hospital. And Brett, this is not like a typical wellness check when you see abandoned dogs like this. What exactly are you looking for? Well, these dogs have no history, so we have to be a little more careful of things like infectious diseases, mm -hmm. things that could be contagious to you and I as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and they harbinger more parasites, external, internal, uh, parvo distemper. So these dogs are usually neglected. So therefore we have a higher incidence of disease. Yeah. And it's so sad when, you know, there are other alternatives to abandoning dogs in the desert. What is your message? Yeah, this isn't who we are. This is one of America's most pet friendly cities. Mm -hmm. And this isn't, there's a better way to do this. Uh, there are resources upon resources in this pet friendly city. One of my favorites is PAC 911 okay. on that website. There's a directory of 140 different rescues that are, are willing to help and so many more resources on social media, but this is, this is not a good alternative. Okay, so, PAC 911. Thank yeah, you, Brett. You're welcome. The news continues for the next hour on 12 News at 4. After the break, we're going to continue our conversation with Brett as we talk about cooking for your dog, what you need to know and include to do it right. If you have questions you want to ask him, text them to us, 602-444-1212. Again, we'll get you the expert answers you need in less than half an hour. Make sure to tell us your name, where you're from, and don't forget a picture of your pet. New info when it comes to nutrition for your dogs tonight. We all know it can be tricky, especially if you're thinking about cooking for your pet. Which human foods are safe for dogs to eat? Will it meet their dietary requirements? Is cooking dog food at home really better for your pup? There are so many things to consider. So let's ask our 12 News expert, Brett Bavet. All right, Brett, out of the gate, I mean, why is it so popular for people to cook for their dogs? People love to cook for themselves healthier choices and their dogs as well. I think a lot of people are looking at ingredients more carefully mm -hmm. and also with the costs of some of these dog oh, yeah. foods, they think they might be able to, to, to do a better job on yeah. their own. And for the cheap, you and, know, like cheaper. Yeah. So what are the key ingredients or things that people need to consider and put in their dog food if they're going to do it at home? I brought a few things to show you, yeah. uh, with the exception of the, uh, the, the protein sources, okay. the meats and the chickens, like mm -hmm. chicken, eggs, beef, yes. salmon. Okay. So those whole proteins, if you can buy them on sale, you can get bulk and save. And you have to have it cooked, right? Yeah. When you're mixing it with all this stuff. Yeah, okay. the Instapot, I think, is the other reason people oh, are cooking. Everybody okay. loves that Instapot. So they throw large quantities in the Instapot. And it's usually a grain source mm -hmm. and a protein source. So I brought some examples of grain sources. You got oats, for example, rice. Pasta is another popular one. It's used a lot for dogs with certain health conditions. Yeah. And then some, if you want to go more oh, sweet potatoes, yeah. You know, wholesome sweet potatoes, even apples, berries, things like that, that round out the, the meal. Right. But basically a meat source and a grain source okay. is key. Now, the problem with cooking for your dog is sometimes it's the elements like the, how do you know it's complete and nutritionally right. balanced, right? right? So all the dog foods in the grocery stores or the pet food stores are complete and nutritionally balanced based by AFCO, American Association Feed Control Officers. Okay. So if we're going to cook for our dogs, we want to make sure that those trace elements and so forth aren't being missed. Mm. So I brought a few other examples right. that I'd like to see. Okay, so like vitamins. Yeah. Need. Yeah, fish oil, vitamins for a you know an adult or a puppy. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we got here? Enzymes. This is just an immune support. And then there's disease or condition specific things, such mm -hmm. older dog with arthritis. You might want to add some supplements for joint health. Right. 
let's not forget our kitty cats if you're cooking for them, maybe a hairball remedy or, oh. or uh, urinary tract health. Okay. Uh, so rounding that out with products like this and maybe some calcium too, Okay. Uh, depending on the dog. And people should really take into account, you know, probably I'm thinking the age of the dog, like you were saying, any dietary needs like the arthritis stuff. I mean, it, it can be very specific. Yeah, giant breed dogs might have a different protein requirement okay. or calcium levels for those big, fast growing bones. Right. Um, and if you don't wanna do all this, this isn't a product that I support or endorse, but this is, a, this is basically whole food in a box. You mm. just add water to it and it has oh. all those ingredients, healthy things like bananas, celery, apples, okay. chicken, etc. Yeah, That's kind of hitting the easy button if you yes. don't wanna do all this. But this has become a very popular thing, and I think it's important that we're not missing some of the key elements. Yeah, so what, are, what are your thoughts on raw food? Because that has become popular, too, with some folks. It is, and if you look, there's some FDA guidelines that suggest against it. I'm not a big fan because you're potentially putting yourself, your pet, or if you have young children at risk for uh, those, uh, those uh, pathogenic, foodborne pathogens, mm -hmm. listeria, E. coli, salmonella, et cetera. Okay. So if you have young kids in the house, and you're not practicing food safety techniques properly, I don't Dangerous. recommend it. Yeah, yeah. It's, a lot of people think it's ideal for the pet, but not when it's going to sacrifice right. something, you know, something yeah. in the family. Safety. So, okay, yeah, safety. bottom line, is this something that you recommend cooking at home for your pet? I don't do it. I just don't have the time. So yes. I find a high quality, good value dog food. And my dog, the outlaw Josie Wales, has been happy with that for yeah. forever. Yeah, so. she looks good. And she's how old now? 11. 11? Yes. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Some might say she's eating too much of that kibble, but. <laughs> That's okay. She's happy, right? Yeah, she, All right. Is, she is. Okay, Brett, thank you. If you have any questions that you want to ask Brett the Vet today, just text us 602-444-1212. Again, make sure to let us know who you are, where you're texting from, and don't forget to send a pic of your pet. We'll get some of your questions answered live on the air in about 20 minutes. Now to ask the expert here to answer your questions live on the air is Brett the Vet. All right, our first one is from Daisy. She says, hi, what brand of food do you recommend for a miniature schnauzer puppy? What about an adult? Daisy's adorable, isn't she? Yeah. So I tell you what, Daisy's a couple things, pancreatitis and bladder stones oh. is what I think about with schnauzers. So yeah. I look for foods in this breed with a low fat content, so 10% or less protect them mm -hmm. and then also sometimes a low what's called ash or phosphorus level okay. and then monitor those urinary uh, monitor for s signs of those diseases but any dog food with 10 percent fat or less would be my recommendation for miss daisy okay good to know lana from golden valley says do you have any suggestions for vegans on preparing food for their dogs oh. What a great question, yeah. Lana. Thanks for asking. And he, the truth be told, dogs and cats are what are called obligate carnivores. Mm -hmm. They have to have skeletal muscle protein to survive. They need it for their heart. And there's one ele the reason is there's one elemental amino acid called taurine. Okay. Taurine is found in skeletal muscle only. Now, if you are going to do a vegan diet, you'll want to definitely supplement with some of these amino acids, namely taurine and carnitine. Okay. Otherwise, I don't recommend vegan diets for dogs or cats because it will affect their heart. Oh, interesting. So, okay, good to know. Liz says, my six-year-old cat is very picky with food. I want him to eat some wet food for moisture, but lately he has turned everything down except kitten food. Is that safe to feed him? <laughs> Cats, aren't they something? They are. Yeah, they're very finicky. Yeah. Uh, moisture in canned food is just fine. Okay. However, they're going to pick up enough supplemental water just by drinking. So if they just like their dry kibble, that's fine. Let them crunch it. It helps keep their teeth clean. Kitten food is fine as long as they're not overweight. Oh. To me, it's not about what they eat, but how much they eat. Okay. So, is kitten food more fatty than like Yeah, it's got higher food? protein, yeah, higher okay. sometimes higher calcium or phosphorus for the growing bones. Yeah. So I think kitten food has a tendency to taste better, but I, as long as your cat's not overweight and okay. she's tolerating it, yeah. I think you're fine there. I'll Otherwise, be. just hold out. She'll eat when she's hungry. <laughs> All right, when you're starving, you're gonna eat. That's right. Wendy from Phoenix says, what is the high quality kibble you use for your dog? Oh, Ooh, Josie. Wendy, the outlaw Josie Tails. <laughs> I've been feeding, 
I look for a high quality value proposition, a quality value proposition. It's something that you don't need to pay for a $100 bag of dog food when the ingredients in a $60 bag are about the same. Okay. So I, certain dog food brands have been marketed heavily and you're paying for that marketing, marketing. fee. Yeah. yeah. So I stick, I, I use Merrick. Okay. Is the food that I use, which right. is, I think, a Purina product. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good to know. Yeah. Don't be ashamed. All right. <laughs> Susan from Scottsdale says, my big pup is Bear. I recently started making dog food for him. I add non-fat Greek yogurt so he can get the probiotics. Do you recommend this? Oh, wow. Never well, thought of that. Susan, like, thanks for sending that picture. That's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> probiotics are good. The yogurt that we eat the probiotics in that yogurt aren't necessarily the type that we need for our dog's gut. Oh. But nonetheless, nonetheless, it's healthy. And okay. I think a it little won't yogurt. Hurt him. No, I don't think so. As okay. long as it doesn't upset his tummy. Sometimes probiotics are overused. I wouldn't say abused. Yeah. Because they can create too much bacteria in the gut and oh. then the dogs are a little irregular. But okay. I think a little yogurt's fine as oh. long as he tolerates it. All right. Great stuff, you guys. Good Thank stuff. you so much to our viewers. Because we get inundated, I'm going to let you go to the green room for the next 10 minutes and answer more viewer questions. So we so appreciate your time, Brett. Thank you. Love you. Okay, our in well, on this Wellness Wednesday, we also want to talk about a difficult subject that many people deal with, a toxic family member. The dynamics can be painful and confusing, but family estrangement isn't unusual. About one out of four Americans have cut off contact with a family member. That's at least 67 million people, but that number is likely higher since some don't want to acknowledge their situation. That's according to a survey from 2020. So how do you handle these stressful situations? How do you recognize hurtful behavior? And what can you do to protect your mental health? Joining me now is family therapist Juliana Lidden. All right, this is so sensitive. Let's start off with defining a toxic family member. Yes, I think we all know, <laughs> you know, yeah. we've all been there. Yeah. And it's a situation where they're either very combative, very needy, there's a lot of drama, mm -hmm. they can't come to the table and make resolution often. Yeah. It can be a variety of things, but you know when, you, when you're involved with one. All right, but you know, many times we feel like, okay, because there is that biological connection, we are related to them, yeah. that it's something that, we just have to deal with, we gotta put up with it. Yes, and a lot of people do until it get, just gets too bad. But I tell my clients all the time, if you, just because you're biologically related, yeah. does not mean you can't stand up for yourself and say, you know what, this is harmful to me. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna put up with this anymore. Um, so, you know, trying to figure out how to thread that needle. And that's hard. the hardest part is having, I feel like the courage to have that conversation. It is. So how do we handle that? Because that's, that's to me, the hardest part. Mm -hmm. It is. So anybody, we always use this word boundaries, right? Yeah. Anybody can set a boundary. But what I find in my work is it's hard to do it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to language it. Right. It's hard to confront the person. Yeah. So you really have to start to look at, okay, how bad is it? What is it in me mm -hmm. that's going to keep me from setting this boundary or not? And you really have to vocalize it. Yeah. Okay, so let's put it in action. You always talk yeah. about role yeah. play, yeah. Julianne. Yeah. That's right. All right, so yeah. I'm the toxic family yes. member. Yes. How do we broach this? So. You know, I think depending upon how bad it is in the family and if you're married and how many people you need to get involved with, but merely saying, you know what, I'm going to have to set a boundary here because it's affecting my mental health. It's affecting me on so many levels yeah. and I have to draw the line. Maybe it's just limiting the amount of time you're with the person, mm. but really letting them know it's me. I can't do it. Wow. And that could, to me, I feel like that could go either way, like, whoa, I didn't know I was doing that. That's or, right. you know, being kind of argumentative and be like, what are you talking about? How, how right. am I, you know, it, it could explode. It could. You know, but either way. Most often, everyone already knows about this, yeah. including the person. They may not see the totality of how bad they right, are, right. which is quite, you know, the case. Yeah. But 
they're not unaware. Okay. Oof. All right. So, you know, a lot of times outside of family, there are other toxic relationships in our lives. It was interesting because I was reading a study. It showed that when it comes to toxic friends, because, you know, we all have one, mm -hmm. maybe some, yes, maybe several. a lot. Um, 84% of women and 75% of men have a toxic friend at some point in their lives. So how do you handle the friend? Can you believe that? Yeah, that's no, a I lot. I mean, that is a lot. Yeah. So a lot of people will just limit their, their time with them. Sometimes you have a big group of people, you know, that, and, and there's one or two that you just can't, right. can't, can't quite deal. Yeah. You have to, you have to limit your time or if you feel comfortable, I always say, you know, you can vocalize what the problem is. Most often, people just kind of move around it, right. right? Can you ghost them? <laughs> you can you can, just ignore them? You, can, you certainly can. Okay. All right, get the hand. All right, Juliana, thank you so much. Time now to ask the expert. Here to answer your questions about toxic relationships is family therapist Juliana Lidden. All right, our first question is from Terry in Scottsdale. She says, I enjoy my job, but how do I deal with a toxic boss and some toxic coworkers? Boy, I hear this one a lot. I'm sure you do. And you know, the thing is, it, it can be so difficult because some people just kind of live with it for so long. Yeah, they put up with it. They do yeah. because they it's can't really. It's a paycheck. Really, right, exactly. Because yeah. they can't really find anything else. But I actually work with them to help them kind of language how they can actually bring this up. Yeah. So it's very different if it's a coworker than it is if it's your boss, right? right? I mean, we have to deal with it in a very different way. But there's still a way to do it. You still can you know, meet with them. You can go to HR. There's a variety of different ways that you can handle this. Okay. All right. Cindy from Mesa says, can you explain codependent relationships? I'm trying to free myself from a current roommate situation. Mm. Ooh, that's tough. Yes. And codependency, you know, it's that situation where you're sacrificing a bit of yourself yeah. for someone else. Yeah. It's a real good way to think of it. And this also has to do with creating a lot of boundaries too, and really finding your voice to be able to say, you know what? I just can't do this anymore. And you have to do it because what happens is you just start killing yourself oh, yeah. inside. You can't eat, you, you can't no, sleep, it, you can't do anything. It affects it's you. True. It really does. Yeah. All right. Annie from Phoenix says, I am non-confrontational. Is it okay to just ignore friends who are toxic? People do it. Yeah. Um, and it just, again, it depends on, you know, how much you can handle it. Right. Sometimes you're in a big group. It's easy to kind of, like we said in the segment, move around and not have to be there. Yeah. But you certainly can. Yeah. It's, it's when you hit that threshold where you say, okay, no more. Yeah. After 50 text messages, I mean, <laughs> it's like, okay, get the hint. All right. Pam from Prescott says, what can I do when our family gets together and someone always ends up leaving in tears? Mm. My mother-in-law often starts it and I'm afraid to get in the middle of things. Well, here we have something interesting because it's the mother-in-law. Right. So in these situations, I think it's really important to talk to your husband about this oh. and create what kind of situation, you know, what kind of boundary, what kind of rules you want to right. start to implement. Okay. Because often the husband might need to speak to his mother yeah. if indeed this is the case. And so work that out first, yeah. how you guys are going to deal with that. That's interesting because I thought you were going to say, you know, you need to take the mother-in-law aside and deal, but you, I, I like that yeah. you kind of, uh, kind of circumvent that out. and have the husband yes. address. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And okay. then you can kind of figure out how you want to do it, or maybe you limit time, yeah. you know, okay. but some at some point you have to bring it you up. You have to. All right. Uh, this viewer says, all of a sudden my husband has become verbally abusive. I'm afraid it's going to become physical abuse. I love him, but this is getting scary. Wow. Wow. You need to stay safe, yeah. you know, and I, I tell women that are in situations like this, create a plan because you mm. never know. An exit plan, That's right. right. Yeah. You never know when it's going to escalate yeah. unexpectedly. Right. So figuring out, you know, do I have a bag? Do I have this? I mean, if it's starting to really get to that level sure. and you need to tell someone, you know, yeah, really tell someone, point. have a friend, right. have a family and an extended family member or someone yeah. that you tell because this is your, this is your life yeah. potentially. And you really need the support. You do. Yeah. And you some do. guidance. That's right. All That's right. right. Let's take a legal deep dive into this case with criminal defense attorney, Hector Diaz of Diaz Law. All right, Hector, this is confusing to some people. You've got a split verdict here. So on the one hand, how is it that he is guilty of sexual conduct with a minor, but then on the flip side, he is not guilty of child molestation and not guilty of sexual 
conduct with a minor. You know, important to, uh, to consider that the jury heard evidence that related to each count, right? Okay. And so each of those individual counts that deal with a specific act, um, a specific time, a specific place. And when they heard the evidence, uh, again, it had to have been that they just felt that the evidence was insufficient to find Navarrete guilty of the, the molestation. Yeah, count. each of the charges. All right, right, so how do you think the judge will decide this case? I mean, do you think prison or probation? Well, we heard, you know, in the, in the lead up here that, you know, he's a first time offender. That's something the court will consider. Um, typically, you see probation in these kinds of offenses. Um, but again, I mean, you're going to see a lot of victim input. The judge is going to consider a lot of, of information that's going to be provided by the, you know, the families of the victims and the impact that this had on the children. Um, but even if he is given probation, there are a lot. There's the, you know, parade of of other consequences that that a person is going to face here, um, which is potentially lifetime sex offender probation, mm. sex offender registration is is a component here, um, and then even if given probation. Mr. Navarrete faces up to one year in county jail. Yeah. So there are a lot of consequences still. Um, I do, again, I, I think this is the kind of case that you typically see somebody getting probation. But again, um, we'll have to see how this turns out. Yeah, and there's still a lot of long-lasting effects even with probation. For sure. All right, Hector, thank you. Let's take another legal deep dive right now with attorney Hector Diaz. Hector, chances are there are more dinner burglars out there. Right. So what could they face? Well, a litany of felonies. I mean, we're talking from criminal trespass to burglary to theft. I mean, this is... You know, again, it's interesting that, you know, we heard that they arrested some of these individuals. They could be developing, you know, law enforcement could be asking these individuals, hey, you want to, you need to cooperate. Yeah. You need to tell us who else is involved here. That might be a piece of the investigation that's going on right now. But yeah, there, this is really serious conduct and it's going to have serious consequences once these people are apprehended. Yeah, another consequence is some of these homeowners, you know, they could be considering defending them themselves and their homes with a gun. Right. Now, you know, how does that play out? I get this question a lot. Um, there's this assumption that if somebody's in your home, you get to defend it with a handgun, or you, use, you can use deadly force, and that's, right. that's, not, that's not always correct. It's, mm. it's a very nuanced, complicated question, and it deals with whether or not the person that, say, uses deadly force in their home to, you know, in, in an encounter like this, whether or not they are acting in a reasonable manner mm -hmm. and are facing the use or the attempted use of deadly physical force in it against them. And okay. so just because somebody's in their house, again, it seems... Does it mean of, that they have the right to... It doesn't. You know, it doesn't. It's take the be, law in their own hands. It's yeah. going to be a factor. Ultimately, you know, and again, it, you know, nobody wants to see something like this unfortunate happen, and, you know, but it, it would be reviewed by law enforcement and, and by a prosecutor. What if they were attacked? Again, that's a factor that would, would counter or would work in their favor in terms yes. of whether or not, you know, they were acting reasonable. Fighting for their life. For sure. Yeah. And again, uh, you know, not a very simple analysis, but it is one, uh, you know, that um, I think law enforcement right now, they want to get out ahead of this because they know that people are going to want to protect their homes with handguns. They are going to want to protect their homes with, you know, and their families and loved ones in this Absolutely. kind of manner. Um, and so, but it is, it's, it's a complicated question. Okay. Um, and hopefully nobody has to, to, has to encounter that. Sure, sure. Okay, let's move on to a national case with Arizona ties. Even though Alec Baldwin's involuntary manslaughter trial in the Rush shooting that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins is scheduled for July, armor Hannah Gutierrez-Reed from Bullhead City, Arizona is also being charged with involuntary manslaughter in the shooting. Her trial began last week with each side arguing over safety on the set. Gutierrez Reed was also subsequently charged with tampering with evidence as prosecutors alleged that she handed off a small bag of cocaine after her interview with police. Gutierrez Reed is pleading not guilty. All right, Hector, two things here. On the one side, prosecutors argue that she didn't hear, adhere to these safety right. procedures, right. but then on the flip side, the defense is calling the set chaotic. So what do you make of this? Well, I think it, this is a situation where, you know, the prosecution wants to paint her as being reckless, that right. she was not careful. She brought live ammunition onto the set. She was the armor. She's mm -hmm. the person that was in charge here of, of running the show and making sure that everything was running safely. Mm -hmm. Her defense has pointed out, and again, they're in the middle of trial right now, and is pointing out that the investigation into her, their client mm -hmm. was really haphazard and it was really focused on her from the beginning and they 
closed off other potential leads, other issues, that really she's not the culpable person, that there were others that were involved mm -hmm. that had more experience here than her, and that law enforcement did nothing with these individuals and in really in pursuing their investigation. So it's, uh, it, it is interesting. I, I think ultimately how this pans out, I, again, really tough, but I do think the jury is gonna come back and find this, um, this young woman guilty because oh. she had the responsibility here at the end of the day of you know, making sure that everything was safe, that everything was, was put in place. Um, we heard some testimony from experts that the prosecution had put forth in terms of you know, the types of, of you know, skill that goes into yeah. to making sure that this is, this is taken care of. And, and really, I think they're painting her out as being somebody who just didn't follow those, those procedures. A little bit uh, yeah. reckless. All right, and if she is found guilty, we know that she could face up to 18 months in jail. Right, and, and again, you know, her defense is putting forth a strong defense that somebody else was here responsible, but I think at the end of the day, the fact that she was the armor, yeah. that's, that's, that's really telling. That's a huge telling. responsibility, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, Hector, thank you so much. And the U.S. Embassy is warning spring break travelers to exercise increased caution, especially after dark. In the downtown areas of popular spring break spots like Cancun, Playa del Carmen, and Tulum, they say to avoid buying alcohol or pharmaceuticals while there as well, as they are not regulated and could be contaminated. And there's also been travel warnings from the U.S. State Department to two of the most popular Caribbean beach destinations, Jamaica and the Bahamas. So let's ask the expert about this. Joining me now is Susan Green of Susan's Travel Services. All right, this has been in the news so much lately and it's very alarming. You know, a lot of people are going to spring break to those areas, Mexico and the Caribbean. Yep. What do they need to know? Well, we always say this to our to our travelers is you got to go where you feel comfortable. So if you don't feel comfortable going and this is your one week vacation, right. it's your money and your time. So make sure you're comfortable no matter what. And then when you go there, you really do have to use some of your common sense. And our, you know, our viewers, your viewers and my clients, they're really smart. Yeah. And you have to, you have to trust that instinct. One of the things that we find out that we kind of go through a lot on what's going on with these, with these destinations mm -hmm. is it is gang violence and it is violence among the locals. They are not going after the citizens the that are coming. Okay. That doesn't mean that you know there aren't areas to avoid, but there are things that you can do mm -hmm. to be smart about going to these locations. So one of the first things we tell people is this, make sure that wherever you're going, that you're going to a safe hotel, Yes. so that you've booked a safe hotel. Most of these hotels are guarded and gated, which means right. nobody can get into them unless they are a person that is staying there. Mm -hmm. Then stay at that hotel, stay at the beach at that hotel, and then if you're gonna go do an activity somewhere off the hotel, make sure you book it through the hotel. Okay. Or book it through a company that is legitimate. Right. One of the big things that people do is they hear from a friend and they say, hey, my friend Tom told me that if I go down the street <laughs> and you turn right and you go to this little shack, oh. he's gonna save you 20 bucks. Yeah. And that's where you can start getting into problems. Because right. you're off the beaten path. You're off the beaten path. They're like, hey, you can get the best tequila down over this road. Yeah. And that's where we're like, hey, use your common sense. You right. wouldn't do that here in yeah. Phoenix. Yeah. I wouldn't go to an area that I didn't feel safe in mm -hmm. to go save $10 mm -hmm. on buying my groceries. Don't do it while you're in a country that doesn't speak English, where you are not the main person there. Mm -hmm. And so you got to really trust your instinct. And that's a big issue. And I think we all have that when we go on vacation. Okay, so speaking of going on on vacation, a lot of people are traveling abroad, maybe it's to Europe, wherever. Yeah. There are things that people need to be mindful of because yeah. again, like when in Rome, right? Yeah. So what should we do? Give us some Yeah, tips. you got it, you got it. So I, I wrote down a couple of things. So when I travel, the first thing that I always do is First of all, I always copy, uh, copy, uh, take a copy of my passport and of my itinerary. Mm -hmm. I make sure somebody at home has it, Ooh. and then I also put it in my bag. Ooh. So in case my bag gets lost, the person that finds it can tell me, hey, they know where it is. And if my passport gets lost, I have a copy of my passport. It's much easier to go into the U.S. Embassy there and get a copy than going, I don't know what my number yeah. is. And Excellent tip. Yeah. Okay. So um, another thing is I really love the bag strap, the bags that have the strap that go across and right. the reason is is it's really difficult for people to take anything off you yeah. I'm I'm known for carrying a big bag that I leave open my mom says everyone's going to steal from me when I'm at the grocery store right. and so you have this bag that comes across you can stick like a water bottle your and it's right in front it's right in front of you yeah. and it's with you and it's not obvious and that's really the key is you don't want to be obvious when you're in location mm -hmm. 
being aware of your surroundings. So that goes back to what I was saying earlier is, hey, when you're in aware of the surroundings, are you on a street that doesn't have lights? Are you in a place? Are you in the public area keeping your voice? You know, I have a trouble with my voice being loud, making sure that you're respectful of people yeah. that you're around and stuff like that. That's so true. Respectful of the culture that you're in. You're, you're not in America. Mm -hmm. If you're in Spain, you're in a Spanish country. Make sure that you're respecting that. Excellent, excellent. Time now to ask the expert here to answer your questions live on the air is Susan Green of Susan's Travel Services. All right, our first question is from Tanner in Surprise. I keep seeing more stories on the news about violence in the Caribbean and Mexico. Are these warnings in tourist areas as well. We didn't touch on that. Yeah, so no, not really. Okay. I mean, not really, but no, they're really uh, in the city areas. Like I was saying earlier is if you stay at the hotel mm -hmm. and you stay within safe hotel areas and you go on excursions with safe suppliers that go to excursion areas, you'll be completely fine. Okay, good to know. Lisa from Phoenix says, where is it safe to go in Mexico? Well, that's, a, that's kind of a subjective question. I would say the three main places that people go are gonna be Cancun, which yeah. encompasses Riviera Maya and uh, those Maya? regions. Playa, Playa del, del Carmen, Carmen, yeah, you can go down there also. Okay. Yeah. And then you've got Cabo, which we call Scottsdale with water. Oh, how Because it looks just like Scottsdale. I've never been, so Yeah, okay, it's beautiful and it's only yeah. an hour and 45 yeah. minutes from here. Okay. Um, and then you've got Puerto Vallarta, which is also yes. on the Pacific side. And those are the three main hubs. What's great about them is they're all nonstop from Phoenix yeah, also. quick. Um, but there are other beautiful places that you can go to. Um, but those are probably the three heavily tourist areas to go, which brings in more safety. Okay, I was going to say, bottom line, it's still safe to go to those Correct. places. Yeah, okay. uh, yep. Good, mm -hmm. good, good. Robert from Mesa says, what are good alternatives that are comparable? Well, so it depends. If you have a passport, so then we can look at other places that people go. The Dominican Republic is part of the Caribbean, yeah. um, but that is a really good place to go. They have beautiful, large beaches. And I stuff just like went there that. last summer. Gorgeous. Yeah. Gorgeous yeah. beaches and stuff like that. We always look back to Hawaii. Hawaii is a great, you know, that's a nonstop. We talked about it last time I was right. here. Um, and it is a nonstop from Phoenix. You can also look at places, if you have a passport, the French Polynesia. Oh. We always can't forget that. That's eight hours from LA. It's wow. just an overnight flight. Oh. That's only two hours farther than Hawaii. So wow. okay. um, it's a beautiful place. It is French, so the food is fabulous and the water is just as pretty as you see in the photos. Oh. Oh, we don't we don't hit that area much. That's yeah, really and it's great. They actually do have family resorts there also. Okay, good to know. Yeah. All right, Manny from Chandler says, I'm having second thoughts about my trip to the Caribbean for spring break. Should I cancel my trip? So that we get asked that a lot. So yeah. you got a couple things you got to think about. First of all, do you, can you cancel your trip? Yeah. Are you going to lose money? Do you have insurance? Is it something that you can postpone? Right. Airlines are really, really generous about you moving your air, but what about what, what's going to happen with your hotel? Okay. And then you got to ask yourself, I said this earlier, is how safe do you feel? If you're taking one vacation a week, uh -huh. make sure it's a great vacation. Yeah. And if you don't feel like going right now, don't go. Okay. You know what? You... This made me think, let's just say there is, you know, the travel warnings to the particular destination that you want to go to. Yeah. Will like airlines or whoever you're booking through, will they honor that? That, oh, you know what? Because there is a warning, we're going to let you, you know, I don't no, know. Not I'll right now. It depends on like where. So they have a, le they have a four level system. Okay. And the level that we're talking about on these places are up to a level three or a level two. Okay. That's not going to get you your money back. When Got you go it. to a level four, we're talking about someplace like Iraq. Okay. There, now you're talking about getting a refund. Got it. Oh, yeah. okay. Good to know. <laughs> Carrie from Phoenix, glad I asked. Yeah. I procrastinated. If I want to fly somewhere in two weeks, two weeks, is yeah. it pretty much too late? Are the deals gone? Um, it depends. Yeah. It depends on where you want to go. I would say you're going to have a tough time in March finding any good airfare. Yeah. Airfares, airfares always are killer. You're going to go online and you're going to find a hotel and you're going to be like, this is so great. And then you're going to go look at the airfare and the airfare is going to be more. Right. So we still are at about 75% of the routes and of the aircraft that we had pre-COVID. Okay. So that means you got bodies. Let's say we have enough people flying during the week that your kids are going on a trip yeah. or you want to go on a trip. You only get 250 people on an airplane. Okay. Okay. So you're going to run out of space real quickly. Yeah. And I was going to say at that point, just drive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, driving exactly. You can drive to Rocky Point. You yeah. can go to you can go to California. Yeah. Okay, Susan, you've been so wonderful. Thank you Thank so much you. for your advice. We're gonna you cut it. you loose, let you go to the green room. I know we've got more questions. Yeah, you got from it. our viewers. Thanks for watching. Be sure to follow our YouTube channel for more content and watch the Ask the Experts segment weekdays at 4 p.m. and right here on our 12 Plus app.